Who are the people making decisions about your applications into higher education? Well, today we sit down with Melody Ferguson, the Dean of Admissions at Pacific Lutheran University. We're going to be talking about the new expectations of students in 2024, how the landscape of admissions is changing, the changing landscape of how we can meet individual students where they are, the mindset as a leader that comes along with that, the willingness to fail, and so much more. I can't wait for you guys to check out this episode with Melody Ferguson. This episode of the Heart and Hustle podcast is an absolute banger because we listen to the mindset and the unique perspective of a leader in higher education today, and Melody absolutely crushes this. Check out this episode. Are you seeing any other trends about this generation as they come into school that maybe the university has to adjust to? (laughs) I think we all have to, right? Uh, I think this generation of students, I also, I agree. I think they're going to change the world in like the most amazing ways because they have developed, I love what you just said, kind of superpowers that, that we just don't, don't have, or maybe didn't come as easily or came much later for us, um, than have come for this generation and for the generation that's coming. Uh, but yeah, I think we've had to really adjust how we think on campus. We're a small school. And so, you know, we really want students to come here and critically question and um, think about having tough conversations in this safe space so that they can exit here and, and, you know, ultimately change the world in some ways. And so that has kind of shaped, it it used to be something we had to push. (laughs) And now it's something where students come in eager and excited to really engage in those like tough conversations uh, once they feel comfortable and supported and like they belong. All right, everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Heart and Hustle podcast. I'm incredibly excited because I have Melody Ferguson here with me today. Now, Melody, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So Melody, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Because today's conversation is really going to be around the focus of higher education and the changing landscape, also the expectations that our current students in today's world of 2024 have for the higher education experience. Yeah, um, my name is Melody Ferguson, like you said. Uh, I'm Dean of Admission at Pacific Lutheran University. We call ourselves PLU um, in Tacoma, Washington. And I've been here for about 12 years, actually, um, but working in higher education for about 23. So uh, mostly in the Pacific Northwest, um, but at a variety of different colleges. And uh, you know, what you laid out is a lot to talk about, but I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah. I mean, let's kind of dive right into it. I mean, so over the last, let's call it four years, right? It's 2024 at the time of recording this, we all went through a global pandemic that changed the expectation that we had for experiencing higher education, but also what's needed to kind of get into the space. Why don't you kind of talk about the current landscape and then let's kind of see kind of where we can take this conversation today. Yeah, that's great. Uh, You know, 2020 was an interesting year for us in higher education. I mean, for everyone, obviously. Uh, But I think it made us really step back and think about how we admit students, how we enroll students, how we retain students, um, also about how we educate students. So sometimes, you know, in times of, of stress, you actually get a moment to think about what you want to do in your future. And I think that happened both in higher education, but also in families. Um, And so I think, you know, they were in houses together, they were spending more time together, and families have become these these partners. And so as we kind of have come out of that, I think some of the things that have changed, especially from like when I applied to college, (laughs) uh, you know, their expectations are a lot higher in terms of your communication, your authenticity, um, what they're going to get from their experience. Uh, I think those are things that they're now just expecting. Uh, Those aren't the things that we hope to do because um, we're better than someone else. They just expect those. Uh, So I think that's one of them. They also really want flexibility uh, in in maybe the way they're educated or the way you're offering admission. Um, They want you to kind of meet them where they're at in some ways. And so I think for us, we've had to really rethink uh, everything that we do uh, in the last four years. I was having a conversation with another leader in higher ed, and we were talking about, and this is perfect for this, increased family engagement Mm -hmm. and involvement in the admissions process. And this was an interesting topic, which was 
student debt today often is looked at as being transferred into family debt. Yeah. Why do we have that perspective in today's world? You know, I actually think that that is a good thing uh, because I think it probably always has been in some way, but now I think it's just more top of mind. It's something that's a lot easier to talk about. Uh, I think some families aren't talking about it at all, yet some are having these really great conversations earlier about the investment in college. And so, uh, yeah, I think you have to, family engagement for us is so important. And we've really seen families as partners in this process. And we work with students, you know, when they're high school juniors, high school seniors, as they're deciding to pick where they're going to college. And for many young people, that's kind of their first mature ad adult, and I'll put those in quotes, I have a high school senior, um, decision uh, to make, and yet they're not making it fully alone. It's not their first independent adult decision to make. They're making it with a support system, and so that might be their family or their high school counselor or their aunt or a family friend, um, but one of the things we're having to talk about much earlier than we ever had to talk about it is financial aid, scholarships, understanding student debt um, in ways that help break down, I think, the anxiety inducing nature that it can cause in young people. There's so many young people that I think aren't even applying to college because they think uh, college debt is so much more uh, than it really is or that it's going to be insurmountable for them uh, when they graduate. And so, you know, I think part of our job now in an admission office is educating families, high school counselors, anyone I, that is willing to listen to me that high school debt or, or excuse me, college debt doesn't have to be insurmountable that it can be very manageable uh, and that most students are actually graduating with less debt than they think. Um, and so that's been something we've had to really prioritize in early conversations where we used to talk about it after they've been admitted. Yeah. I love the fact that we've seen a transformation from when I'm just going to throw something out there. Yeah. It's like, you know, college back in the day used to kind of feel like it was this organization that needed to sell you a dream of come to college, <laughs> pick a major, take on debt, and you'll be fine one day. Sit mm -hmm. at the feet of the faculty and you'll learn and opportunities will be created for you. What I hear you saying is you're having to take more of like a consultative expert perspective mm -hmm. of saying, let's make sure you have all the right information so you can make a good decision decision that feels very, that feels a lot more, I would say, harmonious to the understanding of like what these individual students and families are getting themselves into and what they commit to and the return on their investment. Yeah, I think families are sometimes surprised when we even tell them, it looks like PLU is not a good financial fit for you, right? Because we can't be everything to every student. Um, but that's, we've now seen our job, not just getting them to PLU, but getting them somewhere. So if it's not PLU, let's talk about other options because we're all kind of built a little bit differently. But yeah, there is an expectation that, you know, we're going to help them make an informed decision. And that's interesting, right? Uh, you know, and, and what we've learned is you can't just talk to the 17 year old or the 16 year old or, or even the 22 year old about that. Um, you need to involve the people around them because they want to have a trusted advisor but a lot of times that trusted advisor also doesn't know. This is very different than when their parents went to school. A lot of our students are first generation, so their parents didn't even go to college. And so they want to help their young people make an informed decision about should they go to college? Should they go into the workforce? Should they do an apprenticeship? But they don't know how to navigate that experience either. And so we do try to lead our conversations not about PLU, but about you know, just college admission 101, uh, you know, financial aid 101, uh, so that we can get them some proper knowledge, some proper language, make them feel confident a little bit. Um, and then hopefully they'll kind of navigate that with us through the through the two years, one year, however long they're they're looking at a college. But yeah, you have to bring them along. Yeah, you really do, because you can't take advice from somebody who's never been in your situation before. You can, but it's a recipe for disaster. And I would hate to ask my parents, like, what do you think I should do for financial aid if they never even went through that exercise with everything that's changing? I mean, even this morning, I would love to know your opinion about the impacts of social media on that perception of financial aid and student loans. I woke up this morning and one of the first things that I saw on my social media feed was this girl who was saying, I took on $80,000 worth of debt back in the day. Mm -hmm. I've been paying minimum payments yeah. for 10 
seven years, I now owe $76,000 total. I yeah. paid 120 into this. So how do you feel about that social media sphere kind of tainting the idea of college admissions and student debt? Because it's got to be a really tough thing to fight against. It is. And I... I would have a lot of questions for that young person about like, where did you go to college? Um, because can you do that? Sort of. Uh, so in terms of when a student fills out the FAFSA or in our state, if, if you're undocumented, you can fill out the WASFA, um, the amount of loan a, a student can get from the federal government in their freshman year is, is generally $5,500. Um, that times four does not equal $180,000 or whatever that was um, that you just said. So it's hard to imagine with the regula regulations, which are better than they used to be, so also timing matters, um, how that can happen. But you are able to take out parent loans and private loans, um, which are generally also co-signed by a parent or family member. So this is where, as you mentioned earlier, the, the debt burden is not just on the student. For, for a lot of families, it could be on the parents, on the family member, on whoever it is that's investing in that young person. And I do think there's a point where maybe that isn't the right fit college because it's just too much debt. Um, mm -hmm. But the average student, I think I looked this up a couple weeks ago for four, I'm looking, talking about four-year colleges. So it's going to be less than a two-year college or technical school or apprenticeship program. Um, but they're taking out, usually it's around twenty to $25,000 in student debt. For a four-year bachelor's degree, that should increase your earning potential over time. Um, and, and we're having to have that conversation a lot more than we used to. It's not just about go to college and learn. Um, now we have to really talk about that return on investment. Uh, what does it mean for you? It's delayed gratification, which I think is also hard for young people. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of benefits to a college education. But I think, can those scary stories happen? Yes. But they are the, they are the minority story. They're not the story that is happening for the majority of college students across the United States. And what's great is Google's made things really easy or Bing or whatever search platform you use. Um, you can Google average student debt for and you can put in the college that you're looking at and it will tell you because those are things we're required to report um, as a part of our accreditation and all of those things. So it's used to be kind of hidden and it, it's very easy to uncover. But I found for lots of families, they don't even realize how easy that information is to find. I want to, I want to take this into a little bit of a different direction because you mentioned earning potential, which yeah. I feel like is incredibly important to talk about when we talk about the landscape. And once again, this is the lens that it's been informed upon me. I saw a statistic the other day that said 49% of college graduates are working jobs that take a GED to be working in. Okay. That's a little bit of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the importance of picking a major that has return on investment and gives you higher earning potential rather than just kind of floating down the path of higher education. Why is that so important in the world that we live in today? You know, I truly believe that higher education is a few things for people, but you have to also it's not just higher education doing it for you. You have to use higher education to do things for you as well. It has to kind of go accountability. Both ways. Like you have yeah. to go in and you have to be a little proactive. So there's a couple of things that I think about that. I technically think you could major in anything in college and still get a great job, but not if you just let higher education happen for you. Like if you're just kind of skating through, but I think it's about finding a place where the learning is really important. So you're learning those skills that you then learn how to put on a resume and how to talk about in an interview. So as cheesy as it sounds, I think college is this place where you get to become your adult self in a little bit of a safer environment. If you go straight from high school to the workforce, you're an adult in a day, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas college gives you this time to figure out who you want to be, to teach yourself how to communicate, um, to be in a new environment away from home where you're having to like, navigate being with other people and uh, faculty who, you know, these kind of different personalities than maybe you're used to. So you're growing as an individual, you're growing your critical thinking skills, you're growing your communication skills. Living with a random roommate taught me more than almost going to college did. Don't, don't tell my college, but I mean, learning how to navigate 
living with someone in a very small space and and um, and and not being best friends, right? Uh, there's these interesting things that happen in college that are hard to explain to a family, but I value those so much because I was a first generation college student, and I know how much those things have how they've shaped who I am as a leader now, as a as a professional. But I do think you can't just go to class and go home. So what you have to do is no matter what major, you have to find an internship while you're in college. Maybe you study abroad um, so that you develop a cultural understanding, a global understanding. You um, do a research project. You talk to your faculty about summer experiences that maybe um, are paid summer experiences. Like you have to have that applied element of your learning, I think, so that when you graduate, you're able to speak in an interview about what you'll bring to a company or an organization or whatever it may be. But there's also jobs that require a college degree. Uh, so you can't become a, you know, a, a, a nurse for the most part without doing some sort of college education, a social worker, anything that has kind of a license, right? You're going to probably have to go to some type of school. Um, but even things like becoming a, you know, the number one thing I hear from young people still is they want to be doctors and dentists and lawyers. Um, and all of those require even more school than just that first four-year degree. So, you know, there's some things where if those are your dreams, it's important to start thinking now about how do you get to college, but also how do you afford college? How do you make it manageable? The experiences that you talk about are exactly what was most valuable in my higher education process was exposure to different people, mm -hmm. exposure to different ideas, exposure to having to adjust your lifestyle, that it wasn't just about the Keenan show, but it was about living with a roommate, being able to adjust, holding myself accountable to show up on time for yeah. classes. And mom and dad weren't there with me. Mm -hmm. And so it was a safe environment to grow up. And so I'm so glad that you touched on that. Do you think that there's a little bit of a difference that we experience today because of coming out of the pandemic? We we all were forced into a, I would say, chapter of our lives that was reliant on isolation, mm -hmm. digital education, digital interaction. Are you seeing any type of changes with students who are now maybe having a little tough time coming out of their shell in those social environments that we just talked about? Yeah, definitely. And I think every year it's um, getting a little bit better. Uh, but, you know, it's we're used to entertaining ourselves in a lot of ways. And um you know, I used to say that um, when I would recruit students to PLU or to other institutions, I would send them an email and I would say, the first moment you're bored, don't turn inside. Open your door, walk down the hallway because someone else is bored too. Uh, because I think not enough people talked about how the transition to college is actually hard. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you've given up this whole high school experience where maybe you were very involved in a club, you had your friend group, you had your routine, and you're literally pressing the reset button on friendships, on experience. Um, and so I don't think that was talked about enough. What I like right now is yes, students are, it's so easy to pick up your phone or watch something on Netflix or even FaceTime home, right? Which is great. You can stay more connected, but you have to get out of your dorm room and try to experience the life that you've chosen, this college life, because like you and I were just talking about, it's those moments that actually help you grow so much more. So, you know, we've definitely tried a lot of things here at PLU to make sure we're getting people connected very early around things that matter to them so that maybe it feels more comfortable where they live or where they go to school um, to try to get them kind of outside of that bubble. Uh, but it's definitely a little bit harder than it used to be. The good news is they're so much better about talking about kind of their mental health and what they're feeling and um, expressing those emotions than maybe we were prior to the pandemic. Yeah, I really admire this generation because they were forced to be adaptable. Yeah. They all develop the skill set of being adaptable and adjusting to new environments. Now, when we get to our higher education phase, it's time to lean into those things. I was um, born in Seattle. So we talked about that in our previous conversation. I grew up in Detroit. So I had multiple friends because I went to multiple schools there. When I went to college, I went to a school called Coastal Carolina down in Myrtle Beach or Conway, South Carolina. Knew nobody. Had to reinvent myself, meet new friends. Did that again when I moved to Las Vegas and went to a UNLV here. So that skill set of being able to 
uproot yourself and put yourself in a new social environment, build new friends and kind of restart is something that I've leaned into as a superpower of mine later in life. And I think getting outside of our comfort zone is so important and being able to have conversations about mental health and how those things make us feel uncomfortable is a skill set that this generation has that even my generation did not. No. But what are some of the other elements of their willingness to have those conversations about mental health? Are you seeing any other trends about this generation as they come into school that maybe the university yeah. has to adjust to? <laughs> I think we all have to, right? Uh, I think this generation of students, I also, I agree. I think they're going to change the world in like the most amazing ways because they have developed, I love what you just said, kind of superpowers that, that we just don't, don't have, or maybe didn't come as easily or came much later for us, um, than have come for this generation and for the generation that's coming. Uh, but yeah, I think we've had to really adjust how we think on campus. We're a small school. And so, you know, we really want students to come here and, critically question and um, think about having tough conversations in this safe space so that they can exit here and, and you know, ultimately change the world in some ways. And so that has kind of shaped, it, it used to be something we had to push. <laughs> and now it's something where students come in eager and excited to really engage in those like tough conversations um, once they feel comfortable and supported and like they belong. And so, um, you know, I think in, in a lot of ways, it's really good for us to be pushed by this generation, but it is something where even we in admission, you know, we've instituted some things to help make admission a lot more flexible. And every now and then, you know, we get a comment from the community or for someone who went to college a long time ago, like, haven't you made it too easy? And I'm like, no, like these students have worked really hard. They've earned getting into college, but they have social media telling them they can't get in or they can't afford it. We didn't have that, right? And so to get sometimes them over, you know, some of those those self that self doubt, um, you know, we've had to change how we do things to make sure they feel welcome and like they belong here. Have you ever had any challenges with thinking with that lens of curiosity? Because what got us here is not going to get us there. I shared a statistic that said higher education year over year seems to be shrinking at about six percent. Online education seems to be growing at twenty percent. So thinking about the lens of curiosity as a leader and as your team at your, at PLU, how are you guys thinking about what the future is going to look like? Have you had to kind of break any mindsets to be flexible and nimble to meet this next generation or what's that been like? Yeah. I mean, I think we're not doing it perfectly. There's things we still need to work on, but uh, we have, I think leadership, about, you know, my, the college president here is big on innovation and being unconventional. And so I think I work in an environment where I feel safe, you know, people don't always like this word, but to fail. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's okay to try things. And as long as I'm doing it with the right intentions and with a, a goal in mind and within our kind of mission of access that, it's okay for me to like try things, um, which is not how I've been in every you know job I've been in. And so that has allowed us, I think, to be curious, to try things, to ask really tough questions of ourselves, and then to move forward with little or small changes, especially in admission. Uh, I think as a university, we're still thinking about how do we provide, we're a very traditional campus, right? Residential in person, um, but we've also become a little bit more local. We have a lot more commuter students than we used to have. Uh, and so that has changed our demographic and the needs of our students. Uh, so we might think about shortened semesters. We might think about more hybrid learning. Uh, we've started, but we've, we now have part-time pathways, which is something, you know, we were a full-time, you have to be a full-time student here, um, but to accommodate our students. And so I think the environment that I'm in uh, is really important. And I would say to anyone out there, if you're feeling like you're constantly being pushed up against a wall about your ideas, either find a place where you aren't or find ways to navigate that. Because I do think when you're given a space to try, um, that's the best environment to be in as long as you're someone willing to change and evolve. Does this culture that you're talking about right now bleed down into how your staff communicates with the students about willingness to fail forward? Yeah, I think it does. We uh, have recently been doing, you know, some training, getting ready for the school year. And uh, it's been fun to listen to that people really value working in an office, 
that allows them to to talk to students about fit very honestly, um, to talk about options very honestly, to not feel like they're just having to push getting a student here. Um, you know, we really want them to go to college. Washington State as a whole has a pretty low post-secondary attainment rate. And so, you know, we feel it's part of our job since we mostly are a regional college to help move that forward, even if it means them not coming here. Or maybe they started a community college or maybe a technical college is better for them. But we have a great state need grant and we really want students to use it because not enough are taking advantage of this financial resource um, that's available, you know, just in our backyard. So, yeah. Going back to the element and you weave it in so perfectly, the ability to lean into an expert to make better decisions in itself is something that I feel like the world needs a little bit more of these days. Everything seems so salesy, 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 yeah. pitchy, especially in spaces where we need expert guidance about how we can make good decisions. But imagine how powerful it would be if you had a student who sat across the table from Melody and her family and his family or her family. And you said, this isn't the right step for you right now, but maybe you could go take this alternate path. Then they came back to the university and yeah. graduated from PLU. Imagine the experience because they weren't sold a dream, but they were given expert information about how to make a right decision. So powerful. Yeah. And I think it's teaching how to have tough conversations too. Um, you know, most of our staff have gone through college and I think you're getting a little bit of that there, but we don't, we don't want them to just have easy conversations with families. It's sometimes having that tough conversation. Uh, we find we actually have that happen. So we have families that will uh, go somewhere else and then transfer back or, oh, my friend ended up somewhere else, but they really enjoyed learning about your school. So I'm applying. So, you know, word of mouth is, is your best recruiter sometimes. And I think if you're doing the right thing and you're building trust and you're doing it in an authentic and honest way, that's only going to help you in the long run. Have you honed those skills over the years in being in higher education or what, what was the before picture and what was the I after picture? Or have you always been this expert who's willing to help everybody? <laughs> maybe I've, I'm an oldest, right? So, you know, some of it comes with uh, maybe birth order. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't totally know. I had a, I was lucky enough to have a great, first supervisor who even in my right out of college, very professionally immature kind of way, um, trusted me to, to move things forward and allowed me to try things and kind of figure out that it didn't work myself versus just telling me it wasn't going to work out. Um, and I think that is something I always have leaned back on in saying, I want to be that type of leader for people too. Um, I don't want to be the person that just tells them what to do, but I really want to kind of empower them to do that. So, uh, yeah, I think it's having been in really good environments where I've learned that that's how I thrive as a staff person and wanting to, to make that in the culture of, of the place that I get to, to manage or lead. I mean, you, you definitely embody that. And so I wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of talk about that because it's so impressive to sit across from somebody who has such a pivotal role in educating this future generation about making good decisions so they can put themselves in a position for opportunity. And I feel like education in itself today is kind of an enablement platform that gives you the platform to create the safe space so you can create opportunities for yourself later. And that's super powerful. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how quickly the world is moving mm -hmm. in contrast to some of our spaces like higher education. How are you thinking about technology like AI as an example? And how is it kind of impacting your view of the landscape, work, but also higher education in general? Oh, yeah, I'm trying to see it as a tool, as something that can be used to enhance what we do or allow us to create efficiencies so that maybe we can be freed up to think bigger thoughts and be more curious. You know, sometimes you get so bogged down in your day-to-day -day work that you don't feel like you have the time to um, envision a future. Uh, you're living so much in the moment. So currently that's where I'm trying to be is very kind of open-minded and um, not see it as something that's coming for our jobs or going to replace things or going to make all of our students turn in plagiarized you know, papers or anything like that. I'm really trying to see it as a tool we can use to do a lot of what we've been talking about and to find the time to change a little bit, a little bit quicker, to evolve a little bit faster, um, to, to be able to predict some things that we can't predict right now and, uh, you know, and, and layer it on to 
all the data that we have, all the knowledge that we have about our students to also help us communicate more individually. Um, you know, students kind of want their questions answered, their interests addressed, which I think is the wave of the future, right? We, we all shop that way. We, our music is curated for us. Um, you know, they want college to be that way, but we don't right now have the technology to, to do that at the rate that they want. And so, you know, that's kind of where I think we're going is we're gonna be able to communicate with students almost one-on-one -on -one individually about what they're looking for if we can figure out how to tap into these resources. Um, in, a, in a school like ours, we're never going to lose the person touch, right? We're a small school. That's kind of why students come here is they're known. They get to have a voice. Um, you know, we watch them come into school and we watch them graduate and uh, celebrate that. And so um, how can we do that but also kind of allow us to be more individualized in the way that we're doing things? So. I think it's still super new, but those are some of the ways I'm currently thinking about new technology. Yeah, I think uh, we have to, once again, I'm going to use this word intentionally, look at technology like artificial intelligence through the lens of curiosity. Because mm -hmm. it's very human based and very tried and true for us <laughs> yes. to be like, that's terrible or that's great, <laughs> right? Both sides of the camp, but somewhere in the middle is where the answer is. Um, but also technology has to be an accelerator for us, never a human replacement. And that's where I feel like I get a little bit worried when I see the evangelists or the f startup or the CEOs of these companies talking about AI is going to be the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. When there are just things that we cannot replace, the human ability to sit across the table from an expert mm -hmm. and you know a leader like you, you can't replace with AI. But having those tough conversations like you talked about and being able to help people make good decisions is something that I truly truly intuitively trust you have the ability to do but not maybe chat gpt at this point in time <laughs> yeah but I, and so I think it's really important with a better name for the scholarship i'm trying to do for sure <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly there that's you go using it. but uh but yeah i i think that's something you know we try to say here is we're not a no office um so you know we don't start with no uh we like to start with well and then and kind of, you know, see where that goes um, as, as a way to stay open-minded to things. Let's talk a, a little bit about kind of the future of higher education. So you have a huge impact on not only your organization, but how individuals in the future are going to view higher education. What are some of the things that you're hoping for over like, let's say the next five years to see across the landscape of higher education and maybe how students approach higher education as well? You know, one of the things I really and would love to see is is more students seeing higher education as an option for them. Uh, I'm always surprised at the number of young people with great grades who have done well in high school, have pushed themselves, who don't even think they're going to get admitted to college. Uh, and and I think direct admission is becoming more of a conversation nationally, and and we're doing that here and. I do hope that shifts some of the conversation. There are maybe 5% of colleges that are highly selective, um, but the rest of us actually admit many more students than we think and, and also offer a lot more scholarships. So one thing I would like to see is that they're not choosing the workforce because they think they have to, um, that they're really choosing the workforce or college based on the path they see for themselves, the goals they have for their future, um, not because some hurdle that they've put in front of themselves is standing in front of them. Uh, and, and I think that's a tough thing. I don't know if it'll happen in five years, but I would really love to see that. I also think that, you know, we're going to have to become a college that does think a little bit about how we offer our courses, the structure of our courses, maybe at the graduate level first. You know, I think there's ways to do this in phases that feel comfortable. Um, but I think we have to with what this generation is looking for. And then I'm already starting to, to look at Generation Alpha, which is the next generation that's coming, uh, to figure out how we're going to have to evolve for them because we've had to do a lot for, for Gen Z. And, um, and I think all for good reason, I think all in the right ways. And I think we have, if we're gonna, if we're gonna continue to grow, if we're gonna continue to enroll students, we have to constantly be thinking about the next generation and their needs and not being complacent in the place that we are right now. I mean, I feel like that is an amazing place for us to be able to put a bow on today's episode. 
um, you know, just demonstrating the true example of heart and hustle, I feel like is a perfect intersection where you sit as a leader in higher education today, because you understand what it truly takes to put yourself in op places for opportunity, but also you're helping families and students alike make good decisions. And that takes a lot of heart in order for you to be able to kind of sit across the table and be willing to lay out the options for somebody. So Melody, I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show. Seriously, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. One of the last things that we do here is we ask a question that came from our previous guest on the show. So their question for you is, what was one major setback in life that you had that you wish never happened, but would never take back because of all the things that have happened because of it? Yeah. One major setback in life. Wow. That's hard. Um, I think professionally for me, I had a, a time where I wasn't in a great space that was allowing me to thrive. And instead of recognizing that and maybe exiting from that, I let myself also add to maybe the toxic culture of the environment. Um, so I regret that. It, I was pretty young in my profession at the time. But I think about that moment a lot as a leader. Uh, you know, sometimes you learn from good moments and you learn from bad moments. And I really think about that in terms of the culture that I'm building, not just through me, but through everyone in the office. Um, and there's been times where it slipped and kind of figuring out how to bring that back in a positive way versus kind of leaning into the, the toxic culture that was created. Do you feel like you kind of let yourself get rolled up in it? That's yeah. one thing I've been focusing on as I've gotten older. Like there's a <laughs> lot of things that happen in my environment. And when I let myself go down that path, I mm -hmm. contribute to the bigger stressors rather yes. than kind of taking a step back on the sideline and saying, I'm going to disconnect and not yeah. let this affect me. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and I realized I also was not in a place to change that culture. Um, so I realized I had to, to step out of that culture, right? Well, even though I was kind of didn't think I would ever leave that, that organization. Um, so you, yeah, I had to make a, a tough choice, but for a minute there, I was not making smart, intelligent, kind of heart led, um, uh, uh, choices at, in that moment. Well, once again, Melody, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show guys. Thank you for watching and listening today. Once again, Melody Ferguson, that's a wrap.